Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I am your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, a value investing service published by Stansberry Research. We have a really great show lined up. I'm very excited about our guest today. We've been trying to get him on for a long time, and I can't wait to talk to him. But right now, let's get to the weekly rant. Now, last week's rant was all about my personal model of the dominant emotion at work in the stock market. I said fear is the dominant emotion in the stock market at all times. It doesn't go from greed to fear to greed to fear. It's just fear all the time. Investors are only human, and all humans are afraid of doing something too different from what everyone else is doing. It's the fear of not buying at the top when everyone else is buying, and the fear of not selling at the bottom when everyone else is selling, and the fear of not owning what everyone else is owning in between, right? You may recall that I mentioned a book called The Great Mental Models, Volume 1, General Thinking Concepts by Shane Parrish and the folks at the Farnham Street website. It's a really good book, and we're going to talk about one of those great mental models today. It's one of the most important ones for investors. It can keep you out of all kinds of trouble, and also it just sort of naturally leads you into where you're most likely to succeed in the stock market and in life. The mental model I'm talking about is may be familiar to you. It's called circle of competence. This idea was created by Warren Buffett as a way to help investors stay out of investments they don't understand. Now imagine a circle with a smaller circle inside of it. So the bigger outer circle, that's what you think you know. The inner circle is what you really know. It's a subset of that bigger thing. That's your circle of competence, what you really know. Investors ought to start out with this idea by asking a very simple question. Is buying and selling stocks and bonds and options and all this other stuff in the financial markets, is this within my circle of competence? (laughs) It's a good question. And circle of competence, I think, is just for that reason, it's one of the most important things an investor can know about himself. Now, in that Farnham Street book I mentioned, the very first thing you see on the first page about about circle of competence is a question, what don't I know? Right? That's the via negativa, the negative way of looking at things that we've discussed in previous podcasts. And so that's the negative component of assessing your own circle of competence. Hmm, What don't I know about XYZ company, for example? So the positive component is simply a constant reminder to stick to what you know best when it comes to allocating your hard-earned capital. In his 1996 letter to shareholders, Warren Buffett wrote, What an investor needs is the ability to correctly evaluate selected businesses. Note the word selected. You don't have to be an expert on every company or even many. You only have to be able to evaluate companies within your circle of competence. Obviously, this basic idea has to be older than Warren Buffett, right? 19th century steel magnate Andrew Carnegie wrote in his autobiography, The losses men encounter during a business life which seriously embarrass them are rarely in their own business, but in enterprises of which the investor is not the master. My advice to young men would be not only to concentrate their whole time and attention on the one business in life in which they engage, but to put every dollar of their capital into it. Now, it's certainly possible for you to widen your circle of competence. You're not stuck with your current circle of competence. But widening it usually takes a lot of work, and it happens over a long period of time. So think if you play a musical instrument and you're kind of okay and you want to get a lot better, well, that's not going to happen instantly, right? It's going to take a long time. And that's the way widening circle of competence works. 
Now, the Farnham Street book actually reminded me of another story that Warren Buffett told, which I used in Stansberry's Extreme Value newsletter, the monthly newsletter that I write with Mike Barrett. I, I used this many years ago. And the story goes like this. A guy goes into a new town and he encounters an old man sitting in the town square. It's a nice sunny day. There's a little general store, a few people walking around. This guy's from the big city. He thinks, oh, you know, there's not much going on here. And there's a dog lying on the ground near the old man. There are people walking around. And the stranger who just walked into town says to the old man, he says, hi there. I'm new in town. How you doing? The guy says, I'm doing great. And he asks the old man, he says, does your dog bite? And the old man says, no. The stranger walks over, leans down to pet the dog, and the dog lunges at him, chomping down on his clothes and almost takes a piece of his skin off. And the stranger said, I thought you said your dog doesn't bite. The old man says, that's not my dog. See, the old man, he's a lifer. He's been in that town all his life. He knows everything going on around him. And, and he knows all the people and he knows what they had for breakfast and he, and he just knows everything going on. The stranger only knew the appearance of everything around him. He was operating in the bigger circle, not in the smaller circle, his circle of competence. When it comes to investing, think about the places in the market where you are the old man, the lifer, the guy who's been there all his life or who's been in town for decades and decades and knows it inside out. Because if you're not a lifer who knows it inside out, you're probably a stranger who only knows the appearance of the businesses you're investing in. And you're operating outside your circle of competence. You don't want that. Be the old man, the lifer, not the stranger. Well, you obviously need to be brutally honest with yourself about things that you know and what you don't know. And, and you, this requires some real hard looking in the mirror and figuring out what you really do know and what you don't know. What's within my circle of competence? In fact, one of the hallmarks of operating within your circle of competence is that you have a good grasp of its limits, its boundaries. So the size of your circle of competence is far less important than your ability to stay within its boundaries when you're allocating your precious capital, right? Do you go with uh, you know, a company who, that's got a boring business that you know very well and you're confident it'll keep growing slowly over many years and paying dividends? Or do you buy something really exciting because a friend of yours is really excited about it and he thinks it's going to triple next week, right? That's an absurd example, I hope. <laughs> I hope that's an absurd example to you. Um, but it illustrates the point. You know, whatever kinds of businesses you know, those are the ones you should stick with in the stock market. You can learn about new businesses and you should be learning about them all the time. But you have to decide when you've truly pushed that boundary out a little bit more and that there's something else that's within your circle. Warren Buffett's mentor, Ben Graham, said at the very end of his great classic book, The Intelligent Investor, that investing is most intelligent when it is most businesslike. And then he said the first and most obvious principle of businesslike investing is know what you are doing. Know your business. And this is a quote from the book. Know what you are doing. Know your business. For the investor, this means do not try to make business profits out of securities, that is, returns in excess of normal interest and dividend income, unless you know as much about security values as you would need to know about the value of merchandise that you propose to manufacture or deal in. <laughs> By this definition, let's face it, folks, most people just don't belong in the stock market. They should be doing something else with their money. And I've spoken with literally hundreds of investors. I've been doing this for 21 years, and I've spoken with hundreds of investors over the years at conferences. And, and I've heard from hundreds, probably a couple thousand more, from feedback emails, from various newsletters I've written, and from this podcast, too. And my overall impression is that most folks are all too often operating outside their circle of competence. I'll give you a quick example, just a very small quick example. 
A few episodes ago, I interviewed Brian Dalton, the founder and CEO of Altius Minerals. Now, Altius Minerals trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol ALS and over the counter in the U.S. under the ticker symbol ATUSF. I cannot tell you how many dozens and dozens of emails I've gotten asking me the difference between these two symbols. And I have to tell you, I only thought about this recently. I really stepped back and thought, you know, if you don't know something that basic, and if you can't find out for yourself in the age of Google where you can find out almost anything, um, and, you know, if you just don't have enough experience to know the difference between Toronto Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, over-the-counter, and figure out what those two symbols mean, maybe, 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 just maybe, you're operating outside your circle of competence in the stock market. Okay? Now, I don't expect everyone to know everything about every stock I write about or mention, but there's some basic things that, and, and I could be wrong about this, these people asking about these ticker symbols, that could be just like the one thing that they didn't learn in 20 years of investing or something. But, you know, it could mean that they're in over their heads, they're outside their circle of competence, and they're operating that bigger circle. Remember what that was called? That's what you think you know, not what you really know. So, you know, these same people wonder why I refuse to, for example, write about, you know, options recommendations in detail. And I'll talk more about that later in the podcast in the mailbag. But just think about like, I was thinking about all the real estate agents my wife and I have used to buy homes, a few of them, I guess three of them or so, three or four of them, uh, to buy homes and do various things over the years. Um, They all own rental properties, every single one of them. Now, that makes a lot of sense, don't you think? They deal in the value and location and all the other aspects of property every single day. Of course, buying rental property is within their circle of competence. And I've talked to some of them, they say, I don't bother with the stock market, I don't know anything about it. That's exactly right. It's just like Andrew Carnegie said, right? That you focus all your energy there and all your capital too. Now, in Peter Lynch's excellent book, One Up on Wall Street, I've recommended this book dozens of times and will continue to do so. One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. He says you can, he basically says you can get investing ideas by looking at the companies whose products you use just in your daily life. It's a great idea because you have concrete experience with these companies day after day. Now, of course, The experience of buying and using a product or service is not in itself enough to tell you whether a stock is a buy or not. It's the beginning. It's just an idea generation uh, starting point, really. And then you start from there and you build up your knowledge and you begin researching the business and find out if it's really good. I mean, you know, I use Uber and Lyft, but I would never buy those stocks. They're just loss-making behemoths that appear to be dramatically overvalued, right? But but it makes you want to look into them. And if you think you can buy and sell stocks without knowing all about the businesses you're buying and selling, you are definitely operating well outside your circle of competence. Now, I realize there are people like quantitative investors, but again, people who know what they're doing there, you know, they're, they're like PhD physicists who have been at it for years and years and years. And and they're operating within their circle of competence because the, the algorithms and thing that, things that they're using to trade stocks are just extremely complicated and took a long time to master. So this rant, uh, it, it comes with a little bit of homework. Now, look, I'm not recommending anyone buy or sell anything based on what I said in this rant, okay? What I'm recommending is that you adopt the circle of competence as one of your core boundaries when you're assessing new investment recommendations from now on. If you come across a business and you just can't figure it out, move on, right? Charlie Munger says he's got a, he's got a basket on his desk labeled too hard. And that's the biggest pile, too hard. Just put it in there and move on to something you understand. And look, as I said in a previous rant, think about who you are. Investing is personal. Your circle of competence is personal. It's uniquely yours. So in, 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 that, uh, in that vein, I'm going to leave you with one last quote from a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which is a really good read by a guy named Ben Horowitz of Andreessen Horowitz. 
among other firms that he's been a part of over the years, and recent Horowitz is one of them. And near the end of the book, Horowitz, you know, after a really exciting tale about his journey uh, through the, the tech business world, Horowitz writes the following. This, I have this in a little note on my phone. I reread it from time to time. And he says this, there are no shortcuts to knowledge, especially knowledge gained from personal experience. Following conventional wisdom and relying on shortcuts can be worse than knowing nothing at all. Embrace your weirdness, your background, your instinct. If the keys are not in there, they do not exist. I'll tell you, I love that quote. It helps me personally to find the boundaries of my circle of competence, which is something you need to keep doing. You need to do it every day. You know, every time it makes sense to do it, right? Is this really in my circle of competence? You're always asking that question, right? And, and it just helps me appreciate how much work it takes to truly make, make my circle wider. Okay, that's the rant. Write in. Let me know what you think. Uh, we're at uh, feedback at investorhour.com. Now let's talk about what's new in the world. I usually open a few tabs on my computer and just kind of mark some news items to talk about. I have like 20 tabs open, so I won't get to all of them, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll get to a few of them here. Uh, there's a lot going on. The first one I want to talk about is um, a transcript from the... Um, conference call by Pershing Square Capital Management. Uh, I think the company, their company is actually called Pershing Square Holdings. It's a public company. I think it trades in Europe somewhere. And this is Bill Ackman's hedge fund, Pershing Square. Bill Ackman, pretty famous investor. And one of his analysts says is talking about the difference between Luck and Coffee and Starbucks. Luck and Coffee is a big Chinese coffee company that has coffee shops just like Starbucks kind of. Uh, in China, and their their thing is they're going to grow really fast, and they're going to be bigger than Starbucks, okay? And this is what one of his analysts said on the conference call. I'll read it to you. He says, so I think qualitatively, they're different experiences for the consumer. Quantitatively, one misperception out there is that of Luckin's growing their store count so quickly, they're going to be bigger than Starbucks next year. That's just not the case. So while their store count may exceed Starbucks sort of in the near to medium term, it will take quite some time than that to actually be larger than Starbucks because the average unit volumes, average restaurant sales for a Luckin store are one sixth the level of Starbucks. In other words, Starbucks six times the level of a Luckin store. So Starbucks plans to have 6,000 stores by fiscal 2022 in China. Luckin would ha need 36,000 stores to be the same size as Starbucks. That's not going to happen. Starbucks has just over 30,000 stores globally. McDonald's, which has been operating since the 50s, has 38,000 stores globally. So to be the same size, you know, quoting them as Luckin being bigger than Starbucks is just wrong. And he continues here. And then part of the disconnect in the average unit volumes lends to the margins, which is uh, USD 160,000 roughly per store. Now, the at-restaurant margins, he says, at lock-in are negative 50%. Roughly, as Starbucks in China, they're mid-30 percentage points positive. I think he's saying... You know, their luck in stores are negative 50% margins in China. Starbucks stores are mid 30 percentage points positive in China. And, and then he continues, we just don't think that a model where each box loses money every year is sustainable. And indeed, if you go and look up um, luck in coffee, uh, their SEC filings, um, they went public, uh, I think, Friday. So their SEC filings will show you that, um, for example, last year they did about 126 million U.S. dollars in sales, and the operating loss on that was 238 million. And if you look at the cash flow data uh, last year in U.S. dollars, net cash used in operating activities was a negative 195 million. So. You know, this is a cash burner. It's not nearly as good a business as Starbucks. And people who are, some people um, have written into me and say, you know, you like Starbucks, Dan, but what about Luckin? Aren't they going to beat Starbucks at their own game? I don't think so. 
All right, next, I found a neat article in Fortune by um, a really kind of famous financial writer named Sean Tully. Uh, the article's dated May 20th, 2019, a few days ago. And he's basically comparing the cash burn rates of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google to Tesla, Uber, Lyft, and Snap. Because he says he hears this argument a lot that the big cash burn rates for the that second group, well, they're nothing new because, you know, all these other companies experienced the same thing in their early years. And he says, it's just not true. And he went and did the work. And for example, Amazon burned $859 million its first five years. Google burned zero. All their public documents indicate that they were never cash flow negative. Facebook burned $143 million over two years. Apple's an interesting case because they didn't burn anything in the formative early years, according to Sean here. And, you know, later on they burned some cash, but that was when they were a much bigger company, just having some trouble. Okay, then he moves on to, you know, the the breakneck burners, he calls them. Tesla. Tesla burned $10.9 billion over 12 years. Uber burned $8.8 billion over three years. Lyft burned $1.4 billion over three years. And what did Snap burn? Two point seven billion over three years. So really not similar. And you know you can you you can say there are things wrong with this analysis. You're comparing the wrong companies. You know you should compare these cash burners to you know the dot com companies that didn't make it, for example, or something. But it's an interesting comparison, I think. Next, we got a couple of things that have died on us apparently. Okay. The April 22nd cover of Bloomberg Newsweek said, is inflation dead? And it's got a picture of an inflatable Tyrannosaurus Rex toy that's kind of deflated. Um, And it says, is inflation dead? A new era has some frightening downsides. That is, uh, you know, if, if you ever wanted to entertain the idea that inflation is not dead, what better way than a Business Week cover that says that it is dead? Business Week famously in, I believe it was August of 1979, uh, published a cover that said the death of equities. Basically, if you bought stocks then and held them for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever, uh, it was an easy way to get rich. Something else has died. We're, we keep hearing that value investing has died. And a guy named Jim Osmond from Edge Consulting Group says, value investing has died because nowadays technology, and I'm quoting from an article in Hedge Magazine, where he said, nowadays, technology and machines do so much work and they do it faster. The numbers game based on cheap valuation is a thing of the past. What we have been trying to do at the edge is recognize value beyond the numbers. And he actually has some okay views. If you read the whole whole article, this guy is not out to lunch. But anytime I hear value investing is dead, um, I, I kind of agree that it's not the simple numbers game that Ben Graham practiced 50 or 70 or 100 years ago or whenever it was. But, uh, you know, it's it's not dead. Buying, look, when you buy stocks, your future return is based on the price you pay. If you bought, uh, you know, you could have bought the greatest business in the world at the peak of the dot com. You could have bought Coca-Cola and it would, you know, it took you 13 or 14 years to break even if you paid too much for it. So... I I disagree that value investing is dead. Moving on. We got to talk about Tesla real quick. Um, Of course, Stansberry now publishes the work of Whitney Tilson, kind of a famous hedge fund manager. And uh, Whitney, earlier this year, he said that um, March the 4th was, let let me verify, make sure that's right. Yeah, Friday, March 4th, he said, was the beginning of the end for Tesla. And he predicted that Tesla would trade below $100 by the end of this year. Well, earlier this week, I don't know what, you know, by the time we get the podcast published, I'm not sure where, I can't know where the stock price will be. But certainly Monday and Tuesday, it it did dip below $200 and hit one year lows. So kind of, uh, you know, Whitney's looking pretty good on Tesla. And of course, Tesla has a million problems and things just seem to be getting worse and worse. Okay. Matter of fact, you know something? I have, I have too much here. We need to get to our interview. All right, 
folks. This week's interview is one that I've been looking forward to for a while. Um, his name is Jesse Felder, and Jesse has been managing money for over 20 years. He started his professional career at Bear Stearns, and he later co-founded a multi-billion dollar hedge fund firm headquartered in Santa Monica, California. Since founding his newsletter, The Felder Report, in 2005, He's been featured all over the place in all kinds of major finance publications, Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Huffington Post, Market Watch, Yahoo Finance, Business Insider, Investing.com, Seeking Alpha, and I'm sure a lot more than that. Jesse also hosts and produces a really good podcast called Super Investors and the Art of Worldly Wisdom. He actually lives not too far down the road from me. He lives in Bend, Oregon with his wife and two kids. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jesse Felder. Jesse, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me on. My pleasure. So, Jesse, I, I feel um, I, I really have been looking forward to having you on the program. Um, I, I feel a kind of a kinship with you because, correct me if I'm wrong here, we're, we're a couple of value investors who like gold, right? I mean, and we're not like the dogmatic sort of Warren Buffett mold that says you're not allowed to buy gold. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I want to talk about how you came into all this, but I want to, but we will get to the value investing in the gold too. But how did you become a finance guy? Wh wh at what point in your life did you say, hey, this is it for me? You know, actually it was, um, I became interested in finance when I was a young kid. Actually, I think I was like eight years old or something. My dad bought an Apple IIe computer and he got me a couple of games just to kind of get me into it. One of the, one of them was a game called Millionaire, which was a stock market simulator. Um, it's funny, I found it on uh, on YouTube. They had a, a video of the game and it's the most boring, worst video game you could ever imagine. But uh, but I had a good time with it and, and uh, uh, shortly started, I guess you'd call it paper trading now, where I, I basically started picking stocks and then looking at the prices on the weekends and barons um, and just kind of seeing, you know, how, how stocks would do that, you know, companies that, that I liked. Um, uh, and when I graduated from college, I, I just decided that's what I wanted to do for a career. It was always a passion. And so um, I, I interviewed at a few different places in L.A., uh, and the guys at Bear Stearns decided to give me a shot. Nice. What was it like working at Bear Stearns? You know, I went to work originally for a couple of guys who were two. It was in the private client side, and two, these two guys were, you know, two of the most successful guys um, in, in, the, in the firm. And, uh, you know, I, I quickly realized they were really good at um, selling and, and, you know, generating commissions, but really had very little idea of how to actually make money in the markets. And so I went to find another um, – gentlemen there because that was really what I was interested in. I wasn't, you know, too keen on on learning how to, you know, sell. And and so uh I found another guy in Bear who was essentially kind of running a hedge fund um inside Bear Stearns and he kind of took me under his wing and uh showed me the ropes. We ended up leaving a few years later to start our own hedge fund firm. Uh and I did that for for a few years. I was the head trader and kind of assistant portfolio manager. Uh, through the late 90s and into early, you know, mid 2000, um, and so right during, you know, through the through the dot com bubble, I had a, a front row seat, um, uh, you know, via the via the hedge fund. Nice. So you so you've been really thinking in this way since you were a little kid. Um, it doesn't surprise me. So so let's talk about uh I mean do I have you pegged right to me you're a value investor who also likes gold which is kind of unworn buffett like do, I, do is that uh, is that fair Yeah absolutely I mean I one of the first things I started doing when I uh went to work at Bear was reading through all the Berkshire letters and uh, you know value investing and the margin of safety concept is something that either like resonates you when you first read about it, resonates with you or or doesn't. And for me, that was you know like uh, you know um, the holy grail. <laughs> like oh my god, I, I finally found um, some some method uh, to to sort through this madness. So you absolutely value uh, value you know diehard investor. Okay, so I just want to get to talking about gold with you because it's such a uh, dramatic 
dividing point among value investors. You know, there's the Warren Buffett group that says it's a barbarous relic or it's actually a useless rock. <laughs> you know, you dig it out of the ground, you sit it somewhere and cost you money to store it and it doesn't generate any income, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then there are other folks like uh, you and me and um, I guess David Einhorn's kind of a famous example. Um, certainly Seth Klarman has invested in gold mining companies. And how do you come, how do you come from value investing to gold? Tell us your thinking on this. Well, you know, I think as a value investor, you have to kind of be a natural contrarian. One of my, my favorite quotes comes from Howard Marks, which is, you know, in order to, uh, you know, be successful in the markets, you have to have a non-consensus view regarding value and you have to be right. So, um, you know, both of those are, are equally important. But, you know, looking for when you're a diehard value investor, I'm, I'm constantly asking myself, what's the most hated stock in the market? What's the most hated asset class on the planet? And really, it was mid-2015 when we saw, you know, uh, gold written up in the Wall Street Journal as a, uh, a pet rock and pe people, you know, the media writing about it as if it were absolutely worthless um, and not considered, you know, currency for 5,000 years. So for me, that's my, my you know, uh, value mindset kind of really parked up was when uh, gold became so hated from that 2011 to 2015 bear market that it become became really interesting to me but also from the other standpoint i think you know for for value investors today um i think anything what i've learned over the last 20 years is that with the central banks doing what they're doing around the world you really have to have as much as value investors would like to just focus on micro and ignore macro i think with what's going on in terms of central banking around the world you have to have uh, pay attention to macro and have a macro framework. And so for me, you know, that was, um, you know, looking at, uh, you know, what's, and, and this actually comes back to, I think a lot of people who use the Warren Buffett argument for, for not owning gold, you know, probably don't realize that in the late nineties, he bought up a ton of silver and that was the second time, you know, buying silver. He had bought silver, uh, a ton of silver back in the late sixties also. And in his letters, he explains why he was doing that. He had two reasons. One was um, the supply-demand uh, equation had just gotten, you know, very skewed in favor of higher prices for silver. Uh, and he also anticipated, um, you know, debasement of, of the dollar. Uh, and so I think when you're looking at gold today, it's, it's very easy to make those same arguments that the supply-demand, um, you know, equation for, for precious metals and, and gold, uh, is is um, you know very supportive of prices, but also you look at what's going on with the dollar, and you know people are talking about you know you have uh, both sides of the aisle, a bipartisan support for, uh, or at least um, bipartisan rejection of um, fiscal austerity and, and worrying about deficits and talking about modern monetary theory, and we have a you know five percent. Um, you know, fiscal deficit to GDP that's only widening right now. If we go into recession, that's going to blow it even further. Um, to me, I look at, at gold as, you know, protection against that type of a, um, you know, dollar devaluation that necessarily has to happen when you have deficits like this. So, you know, to me, it's coming from a macro framework, but I also think owning gold today fits very well in, in with, you know, Warren Buffett style thinking about the asset class too. Yeah, that's interesting that you note his comment about buying silver due to um, basically an expected weakness in the dollar. I mean, he he says he says one thing, you know, his official viewpoint, but then he kind of does another. I think um, he he's done that a couple times over the years. Yeah, and I think he's. Um... You know, it, it's it's very much like you listening to Fed heads now. Uh, you know, they they might be you know worried about um, the corporate bond market. You know, Jay Powell, for instance, you know this week was was talking about you know corporate bond leverage and uh, or leverage across corporate America on, on balance sheets, and saying that you know it's it's really nothing to worry about. But he almost has to say that because he can catalyze a sell off in the corporate bond market by himself. So, you know, they. 
I think Buffett has that same kind of stature that um, he's probably, you know, he, he can't buy precious metals today. He has too much, too much cash and the, the, the portfolio size is too big. That I mean, This is part of the supply-demand problem with precious metals is that if institutions decide they have to start owning some, there's just not nearly enough for them to even buy in any size at all. So, you know, if, if Buffett decided he wanted to put 5% of Berkshire Hathaway's you know, net asset value in gold or silver, the price would go to the moon. And so um, I think he has to be careful with what he says because he can move markets so dramatically. Right. How do you own gold, Jesse? Do you buy gold mining companies, bullion? What do you, what do, you do? I do a little bit of both. My favorite, you know, way of owning, um, you know, gold directly is through the, it used to be the Central Fund of Canada. It's now the Sprott, I think, Physical Gold and Silver Trust. And, um, you know, they basically buy, it's a closed end uh, mutual fund, um, and they basically buy and warehouse gold and silver. Uh, it trades at like a four or 5% discount to its net asset value, um, which, you know, is a sentiment signal in itself that, you know, gold is, I mean, I can go buy it at 5% discount. It's the most, I mean, and that discount persists. So there's just not that much, much interest in it. But what I like is since uh, Sprott took it over, um, I believe they, they, they created a redemption um, clause where you can go to Sprott and say, I'd like to redeem uh, my shares for physical, and they will, they will redeem your shares for physical coins or, or what have you. So um, there's really no risk in owning that as, as a you know, paper gold uh, thing, and you can also, you know, it allows you to buy, like I said, physical at a discount. Um, uh, but I also own um, gold miners. I, I think, you know, the mine, you know, for me in, in late 15, when I was looking at stocks like Gold Corp and New Gold and things were trading at, you know, 50% discount to their tangible, you know, book value. Um, that was, you know, like an old Ben Graham style um, type of investment to me. And I thought, you know, in this market, you can't find anything that trades at a discount to tangible book value. Uh, and these things were so incredibly cheap at the time. Um, you can still find things, you know, precious metal miners that trade at, at that kind of a discount, which is one of the only areas of, of real true value in the markets today, I think. Right. We're at a really big cyclical moment. I'm pretty sure you agree with me. Stocks are exorbitantly expensive. And, you know, gold is still, it bounced off the bottom there, you know, early 2016, but still it's not very popular and it's still well below the highs. It's still a great bet. I agree. And also, I don't know if you've noticed, since the 70s, these gold mining companies have just not cared about free cash flow and returns on capital. And they're getting a bit of discipline. I mean, I, I don't even want to say it out loud because I don't want to jinx the whole thing because they've been so terrible. And and mining is, mining is a terrible business, right? But We've seen this kind of getting discipline and generating good returns like in the railroads and then in the airlines. And and I'm crossing my fingers for the gold miners, too. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it's a very cyclical, you know, business when gold prices are, you know, we're soaring through, you know, the you know 2001 to 2011 um, yeah, it allowed for a lot of a lot of uh, you know bad decision making, um, but there's nothing like you know a four five year painful you know bear market to you know reimpose discipline on these managements because uh, you know if they don't they go out of business and so um, I think that and and so you know this is the time to own them because they have been much more disciplined they're getting their costs under control. Um, and so, and they're highly leveraged to gold prices. So I, you know, I, I, I tell people, um, you know, if depending, it all depends on your, your risk tolerance. I think everybody should have some gold and probably be overweight gold right now in the portfolio, just as a diversification tool. Um, but, uh, because, you know, financial assets generally have done, done really, really well over the last 35, 40 years. And now they're more, highly valued relative to real assets than almost any time in history. So I, I do think it's important to diversify away from financial assets in some, some respect. And gold's a really good way to do that. Um, but the miners to me are, are you know, a higher beta uh, way of, of playing that, that trade, um, that you have to be bullish on the underlying, I think, to want to own them. Um, and, uh, you know, if gold does 
I, and I do think this this year gold's going to break that 1350 level um, and, and move significantly higher. Uh, and if once it once it does, obviously the the mining companies are going to, you know, they're not going to go up 10, 15 percent. They're going to go up 100, 200, 300 percent. So. So I know I, I even hate to ask you this, but I know our listeners are thinking it just recently. Um, gold has been a little weak. You know, it's dipped back into the like 1280s, 1270 region as we speak. Uh, do you, do you does that mean anything to you? Do you care? You know, to me, it's interesting that people are still so um, disappointed with the performance in gold. Um, it's up, you know, what is 20, 20, 25 percent, something like that, since the 2015 low. Um, you know, and that's not bad over, uh, you know, a three-year period. Um, and it's made a, a pattern of higher lows since then. So to me, it looks really bullish. And this latest action so far, you know, over the last four, three, four months or so, just looks to me like a bull bull flag pattern, you know, from to technical analysis is something I started studying 10, 15 years ago to, uh, to try and add to my value repertoire because uh, any value, as any value investor knows, you, you can easily fall into uh, these value traps. And so I think technical analysis is something that, that I've tried to adopt to, to help me avoid value traps. And, you know, from that standpoint, I do think, and from a momentum standpoint too, um, Michael Oliver is a guy who I, I was introduced to a little over a year ago, and his momentum work is just fascinating. And uh, from a momentum standpoint, too, gold looks like it's turned the corner, um, might have a little more short-term weakness here uh, with, you know, as inverse to the, to the dollar strength. But looks like this, this bull flag, once it breaks above 1290-ish in the short term, it's going to probably head towards back towards 1350 and higher. From your lips to God's ears, man. <laughs> so, do you ever buy? Um, what do you think of like royalty companies? Do you ever buy those? I don't own any royalty companies. I mean, obviously they've they've done well, um, and 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 people like them. I they've always just to me from a valuation standpoint have been tough to 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 justify. Um, I prefer to find things. Uh, you know, some of the miners. That um, you know, like I said, uh, you know, I mentioned Gold Corp and New Gold, um, you know, uh, back in f- late '15, but got really, really cheap. Um, to me, that was that was really interesting um, situation. Those are the kinds of things that I look for. Um, but I, I do think, you know, in terms of uh, you know the, these gold stocks, and I wrote about this maybe a year or two ago uh, when I was really looking at them closely. Um, that you know, the, over the last I don't know, five years or something. It's been the FANG stocks that have been leaving the stock market and become the most popular stocks on the planet. Uh, And I do think that, um, you know, we're in the midst of a a change in regime from financial assets to real assets. And part of that will be the the bang stocks, as I've called them, going, you know, becoming just as popular as the FANG stocks eventually. And that would be Barrick, Agnico Eagle, and uh, it was Newmont and, and Gold Corp, which is now one company. So I guess it's that those three that are really the, the majors um, that I think are going to become really popular um, in the years to come. Okay. I, I think we've, we've beat that horse roundly to death. Thank you for that. Um, you, uh, you mentioned the macro and not wanting to ignore the macro, and you talk about the Fed. I have a kind of a standard question that I ask everybody who uh, you know has come out publicly talking about the consequences of the Federal Reserve's actions. So here goes. Can you draw me some kind of a straight, fairly concrete connection from the Federal Reserve's activity in the market to maintain a certain level of interest rates in, the, in that one particular rate, the, the Fed funds rate, can you draw me some kind of a concrete connection from there to the stock market? I think you know the the Fed has um, has actually discussed this too. I mean, I, you know, they lower they know that lowering interest rates to zero uh, or actually lowering it to one and holding it there, you know, forced or really inspired people to borrow and buy real estate. Um, and this latest cycle. Holding rate, taking rates to zero for the better part of a decade, 
um, is necessarily going to create a reach for yield. Uh, that you know, people are going to say, I can get nothing from my savings account. I can get nothing from short-term treasuries, and I can't afford nothing. I have to get some type of income. And so, you you look at the the inflows into like dividend-focused stocks and REITs and things, and and there's been massive inflows into those types of things. Um, and it's not just a U.S. phenomenon. It's overseas investors trying to escape negative rates uh, and coming to buy, you know, junk bonds here in the United States, so Japanese and European investors. So um, central banks know this when they when they talk about trying to create a wealth effect. And Ben Bernanke um, spent a lot of time talking about that, you know, in the context of quantitative easing. That they were they were, you know, consciously trying to push people out the risk curve into dividend stocks, corporate bonds, these types of things, and and uh, you know the the money that's flowed into corporate bonds has been what's largely enabled the massive stock buybacks that we've seen too, which has been the greatest source of demand for equities over the past ten years. So. Um, it's been, you know, the Fed has done it consciously. Uh, and, and what's most interesting to me about that is that right after the financial crisis, uh, uh, my friend um, Bruce made a movie called uh, uh, Money for Nothing about the Fed's role uh, in the financial crisis. And I think if you've only seen the big short, you've only seen half, half the story, right? Uh, the other half of the story was the Federal Reserve's role in, in creating the the housing bubble, um, but Janet Yellen um, shortly was interviewed after the, you know shortly after the financial crisis in the context of that that movie before she became Fed chair, and she told Bruce in, in this interview which wasn't included in the final movie but but he provided as a separate cut later on that uh, she said we have to go, somehow find a way to go from an economy that's reliant on bubbles to an economy that is reliant on its own fundamentals and so. She was really well aware of the situation that that uh, Greenspan um, started. Bernanke, you know, continued into trying to push up asset prices in order to boost the economy, and she perpetuated that game. Um, and uh, you know, th- this is this is just the situation we're in right now, which which is the you know Fed, not just the Fed, but you know Bank of Japan uh, for a long time too, targeting asset prices to try and boost the economy, and. Uh, it's um, you know something investors need to be aware of. Yeah, I feel like that, and this is something that I've seen on Twitter too. A lot of folks I follow you and a bunch of other good folks on Twitter, and and they they like to tweet every now and then. The Fed isn't even trying to hide it anymore. You know, it used to be about their dual mandate. You know, about uh, what what is it? Uh, unemployment. You know, keeping inflation uh, at two percent. But now they're not even trying to hide the fact that what they're really doing is manipulating asset prices. And certainly when they caved on, on the raise because the stock market was down 19%, um, that was the moment, wasn't it? Wasn't that like the most obvious moment when they caved in and said, we're trying to get asset prices higher. We're not trying to unwind our balance sheet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's been obvious if you, you know, for, for years too. If you look at the timing of QE1, 2, 3, and, and the performance of the stock market, you know, they tried to stop, you know, end QE1 stocks pulled back. Okay, well, now we need to start QE2. They start QE2, stocks do great. As soon as they start raining in QE2, stock market starts pulling back again. And and then the restarting of QE in every one of those instances was in obviously direct response to weakness in equity prices. And so I think the Fed is is has kind of created this monster where you know they they have to whatever extent they've created a wealth effect and boosted consumer confidence through higher prices they know that lower prices are going to reverse that effect and so uh, i think jay powell just became extremely worried about that in the fourth quarter when you know prices started going down and you look at the correlation between consumer confidence and the stock market and it's and it's you know it's very very high and so you know prices this is, this is also what a lot of people don't uh, appreciate either. They say, I'm going to wait for a recession to start battening down the hatches or put on hedges or, you know, whatever it is in terms of the risk in their portfolio. Well, you, probably under the situation we have now with the relationship between asset prices and the Fed, you know, uh, uh, asset prices could actually cause recession rather than be reacting to recession. It's kind of going back to the George 
Soros reflexivity theory um, in that, you know, you don't necessarily need, uh, you know, the economy to, to um, uh, you know, slow down on its own uh, to create a recession or have some kind of exogenous event like the trade war. Uh, you could just have a bear market, um, you know, for, for because uh, we've gone too far too fast and earnings are now, you know, we're probably facing an earnings recession. And, you know, prices going down could be the catalyst for for uh, consumer um, sentiment, um, you know, declining and, and being kind of a self-reinforcing thing. Okay, so Jesse, if I could just circle back to my initial question, because I, I, what I try to do with that question is make it really concrete for our listener. Uh, it sounds like your the, the concreteness of it for an individual investor is simply interest rate suppression just kills so many alternatives that you wind up pushing into the riskier stuff, period. You take more risk because alternatives have been suppressed out of all consideration. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. And from individual investors I talk to, they have all gone from owning, you know, they don't have any more, uh, you know, fixed income allocation. They've just put all their money into high, you know, dividend paying stocks. And they think that's kind of, that's their new fixed income. Um, and so that's, yeah, exactly what has gone on. It's just, it's probably the greatest reach for yield we've ever seen in history because, you know, you have 0% rates for the better part of a decade and people get desperate for yield. Yeah, I keep hearing this phrase bond-like in regard to those big sort of dividend payers and, you know, the dividend raisers, the stocks that raise their dividends every year for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. People talk about them as bond-like, and, and equity, as you and I both know, is anything but bond-like ever. There's two really big problems, because to the extent that people have pushed equity prices up um, because they're you know, buying for yield, um, you know, that makes equities that much more interest rate sensitive than they would be. And these dividend payers are obviously the most interest rate sensitive um, names uh, in the equity universe. So, uh, you know, as a bond investor, you need to be worried about interest rate risk. Uh, but a lot of these equity investors are not even thinking about it in that way. And the other, you know, issue is that, you know, these dividend payout ratios are also entirely dependent on profits, profits, obviously, and profit margins are at their highest levels in history. So, you know, to the extent profit margins mean revert, um, that puts those payout ratios um, at at risk, and so you have the, the you know the dual risk of not just interest rate risk, uh, which you know you, I think you mentioned before you before you had me on. Um, there's there's a lot of reasons to believe that this disinflationary environment is is turning into a an inflationary environment once again. So that you know that's its own risk, and then there's also the risk of of just profit margin reversion as as a result of rising costs, rising wages, uh, and slowing top line growth. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think that's you know two risks that those investors don't really appreciate. Amen to that. So we're actually getting near the end of our time already, and if I could ask you, Jesse, just for our listener, um, if if I could ask you if to leave them with one thought, what would it be? One of my, my favorite quotes, or actually one of my favorite books, um, is Market Wizards. And actually the, the whole Market Wizards series, uh, you know, all of them are, are excellent. But one thing, you know, the margin of safety thing resonated with me when I first read Ben Graham um, via Warren Buffett. Um, but for me, the, the thing from Market Wizards that always stuck with me is the interview with Jim Rogers, where he says, um, when there's nothing to do, he doesn't do anything. And, and it's, you know, really sounds simple, but he waits for opportunities that are so attractive that it's like looking at a $5 bill on the floor and all you have to do is pick it up. And I think for me, you know, waiting for opportunities that are almost so attractive that you can't pass them up has always been one of, you know, that's what's led to my most successful investments. It's always been the you know, the things where I'm like, oh, you know, that looks pretty good. I'll put some money there that, you know, doesn't work out for me. So just being patient and waiting for, you know, like Buffett calls it a fat pitch. They maybe come around once or twice a year. Um, but having that type of patience, I think, is really what separates the greatest investors from everybody else. Thank you for that. I'm glad you said that. I want I want our listeners to really take that message to heart. 
So thanks a lot, Jesse. And, and again, uh, you know, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks. Great. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Oh, you bet. Our pleasure. Bye-bye. It's time for the mailbag right now. The mailbag is really important to the show. It's where you and I can have a frank, mutually informative, mutually beneficial conversation about investing and anything related to it. So write to us at feedback at investorhour.com with whatever is on your mind. I personally read every single feedback email and I can't respond to every single one, but I respond to as many as possible. So I've got three of them for you today. Number one is from Gene S. And Gene S. says, Dan, thanks for another interesting episode. I was kind of bummed at the end when you said that you couldn't suggest any put ideas, put options. I mentioned that a couple of episodes ago. And she says, although I understand why. It's an important topic that I hope you continue to talk about and educate us on. As for Uber, which we discussed on the same episode, as a woman, I would never get into one of those cars alone. Instincts tell me, don't even think about it. Gene S. Thank you, Gene, uh, for your question and your, or your, your suggestion, really, um, and your, your insight on Uber. The thing is, Gene, I, I'm never going to do an option trading product. I've kind of decided that. You know, maybe I, maybe I never, I should never say never. Because you never know what you're going to learn. I'm always trying to widen my circle of competence about this. So I'll take the never back, but I'm just going to say to get me to do an option trading product is going to be really difficult because I believe that options are just, um, you know, there's too much potential for trouble and and they're too multidimensional and th there's just too many aspects to them. There, it's a derivative of the underlying equity, so it's um, you know, it, it's it's a different animal altogether than the equity, and there are many many aspects. I mean, I wonder, you know, people who trade options, I wonder if any of them know what, you know, delta and gamma and theta and vega and uh, rho and all the rest of it. I wonder if they really know what any of that stuff means or why it's important, or if they know what implied vol is and, and realized vol and the difference between the two. So I wonder, I wonder how many people buying and selling options know how they're priced, because that's a complicated piece of business for most folks, um, how options are priced. It's really complicated math. So, you know, you probably won't hear me give concrete put option um, suggestions. I just, I stick with, with what I said, which is, when stocks are this expensive and, you know, we're still, even with, with a little bit of market weakness in the past several days or whatever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're still bumping up against all time highest ever valuations. And that tells me that uh, highest ever valuations, lowest ever volatility and hedging is really cheap. And I'll just leave it at that. But good, t good topic generally, but specifically, you're only going to get so much out of me. Number two, question number two is from Ralph B. Ralph is an Alliance member, a Stansberry Alliance member. Thank you for that, Ralph. And Ralph says, real simply, how will the Bitcoin be maintained when all the Bitcoin are mined? And how, how many Bitcoin have been lost already? Ralph B. So I talked to Eric Wade about this. Uh, who we had on the program a couple episodes ago talking about Bitcoin. Eric has been there, done that. He mines different cryptocurrencies, and he's been doing this stuff for years. And basically, Bitcoin, he, what he told me by email here, he said, Bitcoin literally never go away. The technology of blockchain means once they're created, they stay somewhere forever. And he says, what can be lost, which is what uh, you're talking about, Ralph, what can be lost, Eric says, is our access to them. If a person loses his or her key that gives them control over their Bitcoin, their, their wallet, then they have lost their Bitcoin effectively. There's no, uh, you know, password help with the blockchain. And so there's, a, there's an estimate that, you know, millions, a couple million, uh, and there was an article in Fortune magazine 
2017, November 2017, suggested I think 2.7 million, I think was the number, have been lost, which means, you know, there's there's fewer of them floating around than, than people think. Um, so maybe, you know, the demand relative to the supply is a little stronger than anyone realizes. But um, Eric says, the nature of crypto having no decentralized authority means that if I forget my password or key, there is no one to help me recover it. And if I save that key on a hard drive, which dies also, no recovery. To true believers, that's a fair price to pay. Okay, so it's never really lost, but you can lose access. Good question. One more, Larry B. from Maryland. Larry wants us to know he's from Maryland, uh, as am I, and, and Stansbury is headquartered in Maryland. Larry says, Dan, in the recent Investor Hour broadcast, you said, paraphrasing, quote, turn around if someone talks about grabbing a small percentage of a large market in order to be successful, you prefer a large share of a small market. And then he ends the quote there, the paraphrase. And he continues, yet in this month's extreme value pick, you talk about owning 5% of a fragmented market and expanding it for success. Could you elaborate on what appears to be opposite ideas? Thanks. I've enjoyed your uniformly interesting interviews. Would you consider having an interview with an options expert in the future? Good idea. I'll put it off on the options expert. Larry B. Thank you, Larry B. So... I won't tell you the name because people pay me a lot of money for extreme value and I can't give away the advice that I provide for them. But yes, you're right. Um, a similar company, we'll talk about a similar company that did a similar thing. Home Depot, right? The, the hardware store market was this extremely fragmented thing and they created these big box stores that, you know, frankly, kind of put a lot of mom and pops out of business. Walmart did the same thing with grocers, Right. A lot of local mom and pop grocers went out of business because they couldn't compete with Walmart prices. But what I think the company I'm talking about in Extreme Value can do, I think it can acquire uh, some competitors. And you see this in another highly successful company called Cisco. Cisco, the food company, S-Y-S-C-O. That's Cisco. You've probably seen the trucks around town where you live delivering food to restaurants and stores and things. And Cisco is in a fragmented market and and has bought up some competitors. And if you can do that, you know, it it it's a neat way to um to grow a business if you can get away with it. Rolling up your competitors, rolling up a bunch of companies in a given industry has created success. Successful companies have done this in the past. So um there's a difference. I think if I wasn't clear before, what I meant was. I was referring specifically to the company Beyond Meat, whose ticker symbol is BYND. Since its since its uh, IPO recently, a couple of weeks ago, it soared a few hundred percent. You know, I think it's a triple or a quadruple or something. It's just crazy. Or quintuple. I mean, it's way up there. It was like, I know it was like eighty bucks at one point, and I think it uh, IPO'd below twenty, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, you get the point. And. Of course, it's making losses, not profits, like all these IPOs nowadays. And there was a line in their letter to shareholders that said something about the one point, I think, one point four trillion dollar global meat market. And I said, when you hear this pitch, grab your wallet, turn around and run, because it's a bad idea. What you really want in a brand new business, if I didn't make that clear enough. What you really want in a brand new business idea is to initially go after a small market and get a big chunk of it. So the difference is between an established business that's been growing for decades in a fragmented market and may have an opportunity to roll up, to buy up some competitors on the one hand, which I think is a, is a good plan, it can work, versus on the other, like Beyond Meat, trying to get, you know, a tiny percentage of a gargantuan, highly competitive market with a brand new product. You see, there's a difference. I hope that satisfies your, your inquiry. Very good question, though. Thank you, Larry. And that's it. That's it for another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour podcast. Look, it's my privilege to come to you every week, and I thank you for it. And I hope you'll come back and, 
and listen next week and the week after and the week after as long as we do this. You can find us online at www.investorhour.com. Go there to check out all the episodes, including transcripts, and you can enter your email on the homepage to make sure you get all the latest updates, including when each new episode comes out. That's investorhour.com. Thanks again, folks. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at investorhour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansbury Investor Hour is produced by Stansbury Research and is copyrighted by the Stansbury Radio Network.